Hello everyone, welcome to our poster about our research on how we combine in vitro quantification with in vivo detection to study protein DNA interactions and reveal phantom signals in gene regulatory network. For years, people have been studying transcription factor proteins, which regulate gene expression by recognizing specific DNA targets across the genome. Thus, profiling genomic binding of transcription factors is of interest in order to understand their regulatory roles. ICES have been developed to characterize TFDNA binding both in vivo and in vitro. One of the most commonly used in vivo technique is the ChIP-seq assay. It captures the localization of a transcription factor across the genome in an endogenous cellular context. However, its resolution is limited from tens to hundreds of base pairs. Among in vitro assays, the protein binding microarray is one of the most widely used. It has the advantage of being highly quantitative and easy to interpret, but the assay is not performed endogenously. There has been a gap between in vitro and in vivo data. Direct comparisons between them typically show a poor correlation. This is usually blamed on the fact that in vitro assays are not performed in the cellular context, which is certainly part of the reason. But given all the differences in the ex experimental procedures, we hypothesized there is more to the story. We aim to better understand this disagreement. The, consist the consistency between in vitro and in vivo data and answer if the knowledge from them can be integrated. So, we implemented a pipeline that computationally follows the steps of a ChIP-seq experiment. Specifically, we first created a snapshot of the TFDNA interactions in the cell, based on in vitro major specificities and considering critical cellular context, such as chromatin accessibility. Then, according to ChIP protocol, we share the lumpies of DNA into small fragments. Next, we computationally perform antibody pull-down and set selection steps, and finally, we obtain the sequencing reads just like the data gained from ChIP-seq. To answer how does the binding information flow through these steps, we made direct comparisons between the input, which is the probability, and the output of the pipeline, which are the simulated reads. And we use reads pairs to quantify the binding level and make the output reads comparable to the input. We observed a decent correlation. However, the simulated experimental procedures introduced some technical biases that caused the risk pairs to deviate from the input probabilities. Next, we compared the simulated risk to actual ChIP-seq data and observed an overall good agreement in the genome browser tracks. We also looked at the entire dataset more quantitatively by comparing the real versus simulated ChIP-seq risk pairs. We found a relatively good correlation, as shown here from MIC in HeLa3 cells. The correlation observed here is not much lower than the correlation observed between two independently generated ChIP-seq datasets. We can do the same analysis for MIC in more cell lines, and we can also generalize to more transcription factors. Overall, our simulation largely recapitulates the cellular binding profile observed in ChIP-seq ex experiments. This indicates that, despite the complexities of the cellular context, the intrinsic binding pattern of transcription factors is consistent between in vitro and in vivo. Therefore, we propose using the knowledge gained from in vitro assays to complement in vivo data and thus gain a better understanding of transcription factor binding in the cell. Now we know that quantitative information is to some extent preserved in in vivo chipset data. But given its limitation in correlation, can we really draw quantitative conclusions from this type of data alone? To answer this question, we use one major application of ChIP-seq, calling differential binding, as an example. TFDNA interactions tend to change, and the level of change needs to be evaluated. When this change is dramatic, it can be directly reflected by ChIP-seq, but in the scenario where differences is less prominent, it is very likely that we cannot make a confident call. In such cases, we propose that extra knowledge, such as quantitative information from in vitro assays, is needed to call differential binding. To illustrate this, we focus on the situation where transcription factor binding is affected by the presence of a competitor. Most eukaryotic transcription factors are part of large protein families with paralogs of the same family recognizing similar DNA sequences and has the potential to compete with each other for DNA binding. The result of competitive binding between two paralogs can be difficult to predict, since during evolution, paralogs diverge in their specificities, and it differs the winner of the competition at different genomic sites. As a model system, we use the human TFs, MIC and MAT, which have highly similar DNA binding specificities but performing different regulatory functions.
and we hypothesize that MIC and MET compete for DNA binding in the cell, which contributes to their regulatory rules. We obtained ChIP-seq data on MIC in a cell line where its competitor MET is overexpressed, and then we compared the ChIP-seq data to MIC binding in regular HeLa3 cell line. If the increased amount of MET can outcompete MIC, we are expecting to see this effect in ChIP-seq data. However, we found that direct analysis of ChIP-seq data for competing TFs are inconclusive in terms of whether or not the competition is captured by the data. When comparing the cellular binding of MIC with and without competition from MET, the correlation observed here is as good as what we previously saw between two MIC ex experiments performed under the same condition. Here we show that in the case, ChIP-seq data alone is inconclusive. We combine prior knowledge from in vitro measurements to help revealing that competition is happening in the cell. With the binding preferences of MIC and MET profiled by in vitro assays, we first model the competition between them and visualize how we expect MET to outcompete MIC. We saw that MIC can be outcompeted by MET, shown by a decrease in its DNA binding levels. But due to the differences in their DNA binding preferences, the level of their competition is different at different genomic sites. MET can effectively outcompete MIC at sites that are preferred by MET, but not at sites that are preferred by MIC. We we'll describe this competition outcome using what we call resilience. Based on resilience, we stratify the genomic binding sites of MIC and MET based on in vitro knowledge. Then we go back to chip seq data and computed the in vivo resilience for the two groups of sites. We found that genomic sites with higher in vitro resilience also have higher resilience in vivo. In other words, sites differentially bound in vitro also show different binding signals in the cell, according to ChIP-seq. This demonstrates that the DNA binding patterns resulting from MAC-MAT competition in the cell are consistent with our in vitro observations. So the competition between MIC and MET are captured by ChIP-seq data. However, it's not directly visible and can only be seen with additional knowledge from in vitro assays. This suggests that applying in vitro quantification to the interpretation of in vivo ChIP-seq data may push the limits of ChIP-seq sensitivity and reveal subtle signals in gene regulatory network. And thank you very much for your attention.